So, hi, uh, I'm Casey Braunschweig. I'm a production engineer at Meta, uh, and we're going to talk about distributed systems, or distributed systems philosophy. Um, so, it's getting close to 20 years that I've been working on large distributed systems now. And if you want to learn about distributed systems, I think the standard approach to that, or like the depth first search for that kind of knowledge, um, would be you know, you go, you get an engineering degree, you get a CS degree, maybe you get a master's degree, um, you get an internship, you go work at a tech company, like you sort of grow from there. And I did not do any of those things. Um, and so I would call this the, the opposite of that. That would be breadth first. And so let me tell you about how, how I got started with this. Um, so I did go to school. You know, some, some people skip that part too. Uh, I went to USC right here in LA, right on. Um, but I did not get a CS degree. So my, I went to theater school. Uh, I did also go to the business school, um, information systems and operations management, because for some reason they glommed together information systems with manufacturing operations. That will become relevant later, it turns out. Um, and also I've been a scale volunteer since the very beginning of scale, um, thanks to being drugged here by somebody who's still in the audience today. So thank you very much for that uh, and appreciate you all still being here. Um, I owe a lot to scale. <coughs> so. After I graduated, I started working in the industry. I got a job at Ticketmaster.com, um, started working on uh, you know, high-speed, high-volume sales, large queues, so you know, hundreds of thousands of people queuing online to buy 5,000 concert tickets, um, which turns out to be a, a unique and challenging distributed systems problem. Um, and interestingly, the, so the first thing that became immediately relevant to me was queuing theory or waiting line theory. Um, and I had actually learned this in school. I learned this in the one operations management class that they made us take when you were otherwise an information systems focused person. Um, and I didn't care at all about it because I had nothing to apply it to. Um, but I suddenly went back and I'm like, oh, do I still have that book? Let me learn something about waiting line theory because I'm gonna spend, turns out, the next five years caring a lot about queuing. So I started to reflect on, on education and how I learned things. Um, and I went on to Edmunds.com, was there for a short period of time, worked on configuration management, which is largely what got me in the door at Facebook, working on chef and configuration management at massive scale. Uh, after I worked on that for a while, I worked on log infrastructure and stream processing, also at very large scale, crazy large scale. Uh, and then I worked on coordination infrastructure, which at the time was Apache Zookeeper, now it's other things, um, but similar ideas. And then now I work on public cloud infrastructure, tooling for things that we run in public cloud, which we actually do. Uh, I know we're known for our data centers, but we do have some things in public cloud as well, which means learning you know, whatever the new thing is today. Um, so let me take a step back to distributed systems and computer science in general. There was this guy, Phil Carlton, who was at Netscape in the 90s, who said there's only two hard problems in computer science. <laughs> some of you may have heard this. And let me stop blowing into this. Yeah, maybe it's a little better. So, two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Um, and then somebody pointed out later that there's also off by one errors. Some people have heard this joke. <clears throat> and it is a joke, but I also like this joke. I like it, I think it's funny, but it also captures three problem areas that I think really do exist in computer science. Uh, and if we think about these a little more broadly. So, cache invalidation is like, math problems, actual things that are computationally difficult, actual algorithms, right? And this is a real thing, this really does happen, but there are also people problems, right? We have to write software that has to be written by people, understood by people, maintained by people, deployed by people, um, you know, all the things that we talked about yesterday at DevOps days. Um, and that's equally important. You can fail hard at software without having any math problems. Um, and then there's just bugs and weird shit that happens. Like, you have to deploy this in the real world, and weird stuff happens and you have to deal with it. This is not theory, this is practice. Um, and that's also important. And I know a lot of people are interviewing, I'm not here to talk about interviewing today, but I know a lot of people are interviewing and it's tough and like whatever you have to do to get the job at the company you wanna get, great, go do it. Like I have no problem with that. But if you're talking like reading about tech company interviews and people grinding on leak code and all that stuff that's super focused on algorithms and like that first problem area, that is not a good representation of what we do in this job. Like, that is probably the least of these three areas that you spend your time on. So, I just, I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair, I don't think it's a good thing for the industry. It's, it's just a bummer, really. 
So what are we going to talk about today? <coughs> I didn't start my timer, so I don't even know how I'm doing. So we're going to start with the fallacies of distributed computing, which is a thing that's existed for a while, we'll talk about. And then I'm going to opine on some philosophy and things that I've learned over time. And then we'll try to apply that to some actual algorithms and patterns and things that you might see or might have seen. And then we'll draw some conclusions from that. So the fallacies of distributed computing. Before we start with this, I should be clear here that everything these days is a distributed system, really. Um, you know, there's nothing really interesting that anybody's going to do on like a single process on a single machine. Like that's just boring, right? Whether you have a bunch of Raspberry Pis on your desk or like a bunch of freaking containers running God knows where or actual like global cloud infrastructure, whatever it is, there is some aspect of distributed systems that's a part of it. So this applies to you. This concept of the fallacies of distributed computing came out of Sun Microsystems also back in the 90s um, and it was a series of false assumptions that new programmers invariably make working on distributed systems. Um, I'm just going to tell you what they are. This is straight from Wikipedia, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, the fallacies are the network is reliable, latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite, the network is secure, topology doesn't change, um, there's one administrator, his name is Phil, um, transport cost is zero, and the network is homogenous. Now, in the abstract, when I read these out, and we're not going to go through them with examples and stuff, um, it's very easy in the abstract to be like, well, of course, nobody believes any of those things. Nobody would do that in practice. Um, but it happens all the time because there's a difference between reading these on the page and taking a running system that you've built that you're kind of proud of that you think is pretty clever and then like keeping these in mind as it changes, as your situation changes. These aren't necessarily mistakes. They're potentially false assumptions that we make all the time. These are spherical cows. Um, I hope you like Gen AI. That's what I did for all my images. Um, do people know what spherical cows are? Somebody told me that they heard them as spherical chickens. So imagine that you're, you know, th there was this dairy farmer, right? And he wanted to optimize his dairy farm. He wanted to get milk production up. And so he went to some smart friends of his that worked at the local university and said, hey, can you guys tell me how to optimize my dairy operation? And they were like, sure, whatever, like, well, happy to help. Um, it turns out his really smart friends are very smart, and they're all physicists. They work in the physics department at this university. Uh, I don't know why he asked them for help, but hey. Um, but they went and they dutifully did a bunch of research and wrote a report and came back and said, we have come up with a theory for the perfectly optimal milking operation. Like, it's perfect. But it only works for spherical cows on a fr frictionless field. Yes, in a vacuum. <coughs> so, bold assumptions that don't have a lot to do with how cows actually work. But here's the thing, those assumptions, th th it's, it's taken to an extreme, it's a little silly, um, but physicists do this all the time, we all do this all the time. You simplify things down and make assumptions. Are those assumptions mistakes? I don't know. It depends on what problem you're trying to solve and whether that simplification helps you um, or is a mistake. Right? Let's make that a little bit more tangible. Let's say you live in Southern California, you work for a small web company or a small company that's like brick and mortar, right? But you run a consumer facing website for customers that are all in the west coast of the US. So you run your website out of cloud data centers that are on the west coast of the US and you have some geographic reliability and life is good. Um, you know, you, you're not dumb, like the latency isn't zero for your customers and like the network isn't completely reliable. Regions have problems, but all these regions are roughly okay. Like they're pretty close, they're pretty fast, they have good connectivity. Like they're all kind of the same. You don't need to worry too much about those things um, until one day when your marketing campaign goes viral. Right? And now you get international or na nationwide attention, right? People start hitting your site. Or your CEO makes a deal for franchising in Australia, right? And now you're going to expand across the ocean. Your topology is going to change. All of these things are going to change. All of these assumptions that you made no longer hold, and you have to revisit all of that. It wasn't wrong before, but it sure is now. Like, people make that kind of error all the time. <coughs> So 
let's take that into the data center. Um, I think people know about system optimization. If you've ever done optimization at any level, you've probably thought about bottlenecks, right? When you're optimizing something, one aspect of your system is going to be the part that's making it slow. That's the bottleneck. And if you're not optimizing that piece, you're wasting your time. Making everything else faster won't help. The way this usually works out for like some large application in a data center is that that bottleneck is gonna be one of three things, compute, network, or power. Um, and this is a cycle that repeats, hence the bottleneck cycle. So in the best case scenario, if you have a business that runs some application in a data center, you've bought some compute and you're trying to utilize that as much as possible. You want to use all of that CPU to do transactions to turn that compute into money for your business, right? Um, and so when you run out of compute, you buy more compute and you do more transactions and you print more money and life is good, ideally. So one day you get that next piece of compute, that next rack, that next whatever, and you can't utilize it anymore because you're running out of network, typically. You're running out of something else. Now you have to go optimize that. Adding another layer of compute doesn't help anymore. It um, doesn't help with the actual problem, the thing that prints you money. Um, and so you go work on that. And after you work on that, maybe you can do that again. You can go back and forth on these for a while. And then that stops working, right? You find out you, there's not enough physical space in the data center to put more compute or more network, or there's not enough power to turn it on. Um, or you can't hire enough construction companies to build more data centers in the world. Like whatever scale you're operating at, like you will hit this thing. Um, and so one of those three things will become your bottleneck and you go around and around and try to solve these problems. Um, this sort of three-way trade-off is a thing that comes up a lot. Um, it also happens in project management. This one I bet you all have seen. Um, good, fast, and cheap, pick two, right? A lot of people have seen that. Um, you run a business, so you have to pick cheap. So really, you can choose between good and fast, unless you are selling things to the government, in which case you probably can't have any of these three. It's a different problem. <coughs> um, so that's the project management piece. So let's talk about a little bit of philosophy. So to keep with our education theme, uh, if you've taken a philosophy class, you know uh, philosophy is not about getting the right answer. It's about some stuff to think about. Um, and so what we take from that are trade-offs, things to think about. And when I say trade-off, it's important you understand this is non-binary. It's not about column A or column B, it's about picking what to focus on and you can be anywhere along a spectrum between those two things. Um, and really this comes from that triangle that we just talked about. Typically there's three things and usually one of those things is imposed on you and it's very hard for you to actually choose to change. And so the other two are where you can trade off um, and choose where you're going to spend your time, whether it's network versus compute, good versus fast, like a lot of things. So let's apply this back to our little joke about hard problems in computer science. Um, and it works like this. There's algorithms and math, you can spend time on that, optimize that, there's people problems, and then there's just weird shit, there's entropy. And like, you can't change that. That is imposed on you by the fact that we exist in this reality and you have to deal with it. So this brings us to a point in my career where um, I'm starting out at Facebook and so I'm working on larger systems than I've ever touched before, larger problems than I've ever had, and I'm learning about configuration management at, at that scale. This is also about the time of John Oswald's web operations book and I was learning a lot about on-call and incident management and a lot of stuff like that, which is super interesting and not what this talk is about. Um, but I read this thing called How Complex Systems Fail, written by a medical doctor named Richard Cook. It got a lot of playback at this time. If you haven't read it, please go read it. It's very short, it's awesome. Um, and it's all like, it has a bunch to say about how things fail, how you prevent failure. Um, and it's not written about computers at all. This is a medical doctor writing about how people die in operating rooms. Uh, also, my dad was a doctor, and so it's a, it was a fun connection. Like, it, anyway, go read it, it's awesome. Um, but we're not here to talk about incident management and that sort of stuff, but it also caused me to step back and think about why somebody who is a doctor writing about patients and patient safety, like why was this so relevant to computing? And so I took a different view of the systems I was working on. Um, by the way, this is my Gen AI attempt at the Swiss cheese model, for those of you that have seen that. Um, 
the thing that I came to think about is I had always thought of systems in general and systems problems as something to be understood. Um, I didn't have this background, didn't have that deep knowledge, and I saw a bunch of people, I had also had imposter syndrome, which I still do, and I thought all these people were smarter than me, and they sort of understood everything, and I didn't because I wasn't smart enough. Um, and as I started to see larger and larger systems, I started to realize that at large scale, it's impossible for anyone to hold that in their head. It can't be just because these people are smarter. Nobody does that. There's something different going on. And I started relating it to what Richard Cook was writing about, about biological systems and thinking about how complex biological systems work. So if you think about your body, like people, animals, anything, are these massively complex systems made up of simple cells, like tons and tons of simple cells that all work together to produce our bodies. And our bodies work in degraded modes all the time, right? There's, we have an immune system that's constantly fighting things off, and we're trying to be at our best, but it doesn't always work. We're trying to perform at our best, but we're never at 100%, and yet we create these amazing things. We create the whole world around us, right? Um, fantastically complex, but not designed to be complex. Built out of simple components that work together to create complexity as an emergent property. Um, and as I saw well-designed distributed systems, they have the same characteristic. Things that are designed to be complex are impossible to understand and impossible to make reliable. Things that are built out of simple components, people can understand. They can understand the simple components and then make assumptions about the larger system. Um, and also they tend to be more reliable. <coughs> so it changed my way of thinking about that and it changed my way of thinking about my own ability to understand this stuff. And so I think, when you work in small scale, as everyone does when they're starting out, it tempts you with this myth where you think you're really smart because you can understand everything. Um, and it also has this thing that I describe as inertia. When you have a small scale system, it's typically very easy to turn the whole thing off, right? Something's wrong and you can sort of understand all the starting conditions and you turn the whole thing off and reset all the starting conditions and understand it all and turn it back on again. When you have something like Meta's infrastructure, that is impossible. Cold starts are not a thing. When you have a human body, again, cold starts are really a problem. You don't want to try to do that. <laughs> Typically doesn't work out. But you see this, right? If Meta's ever been down, oftentimes we know how to fix the cause of the, the cause, as if there's a single root cause. That's a whole different talk. Um, but we know how to fix the problem very quickly, and it still often takes hours for it to be back to normal, because these systems have this inertia that you have to get through to recover, right? which is why I'm still coughing, even though I'm past the toddler plague. Um, so, so we have these choices, all right? Um, and again, I was working on configuration management. This is not a talk about configuration management, but if you were there in that time, there was this philosophical debate going on between command and control and cooperation, or imperative and declarative methods of configuration management. It's, I don't want to start that because that's not what we're here to do and people have opinions, whatever. I was working on Chef, so you probably have a good idea where I came down on that. Um, but let's think about how this, how this trade-off works. Um, in an imperative system, you're describing a specific set of actions. You're like, I'm going to know the state of a system, I'm going to say a bunch of things that are supposed to happen, and then I'm going to force reality to bend to my will, and then at the end of it, I'm going to have the system I want to have. Right? It's, this idea that you will be in control and you will know and you will from like in a centralized way be able to have certainty about a larger system that you can't necessarily hold all in your head at once. It's a bold claim. And then there's the other model of cooperation and declare where we declare the state that we want the world to be in and we design a system that attempts to converge on that state over time and it becomes very very difficult to know at any one moment are we actually in that state or not but we're very confident that we're trying to get there and things will probably be better than they are now soon, right? Much like our immune system. Um, and at this point, I started getting some of the academic backing for this. So there's a guy named Mark Burgess who spoke here at Scale, who's awesome, um, who's a college, is a professor, is a pure academic. Um, at this point, I read the book. Like, it is very dense, it is very academic. If you're really interested in this stuff, give it a read. It is not easy to parse. I would probably not have been able to get through it, but I was fortunate enough at the time to work with Adam Jacob, the guy who wrote Chef, who's also spoken here and is awesome. Adam is not an academic. He is deeply focused on pragmatically helping sysadmins solve real world problems. 
Um, and he's really good at relating this stuff. And so that gave me a way in to this thing that was very deep about promise theory and about the sort of mathematical and philosophical backing of why this approach to configuration management works um, and helped me make it real for a real problem I was trying to solve. So that was my journey with configuration management. Um, and, and these ideas extend to any sort of pull system versus push-based system, right? And this comes up a lot of you can have a push-based system or you can have a pull-based system. And in the pull-based system, then you want to build push-like semantics because they will help you for some reason. And you can generally do that, but it takes some extra work. Like, and, you, and you learn about these trade-offs. So, so that was a big learning of trade-offs for me. Um, so everything I've been talking about may, like the next thing I wanted to put on this slide was certainty versus entropy. That felt like the next short, concise thing to have here as a trade-off. And I really wanted to do it. And in thinking about this talk, I realized I was wrong. Um, it's not about certainty. Entropy is not optional. Uh, the actual trade-off here is the myth of certainty, this thinking that we know what's going to happen, versus accepting that entropy is not optional, that the real world is a thing, and that we have to deal with that, and that we are attempting to mitigate that entr entropy as much as possible. It doesn't sound clean, and in practice, it's not. Like, this is a hard truth about working in the real world. Uh, but let's step back from that for a second. Speed versus completeness. This is another one that's a little more concise. After I worked on configuration management, I moved on to log processing and, and logging infrastructure and data stores, moving data. Um, so if you're building a data store, you're collecting a lot of data that you want to query, do you care more about speed or completeness? Like, I don't know. You need to tell me what problem you're trying to solve. If you tell me you're collecting that data because you want to do financial reporting on it, you probably care a lot about completeness. Like, you will wait for a slow query to make sure that you query that data when you can guarantee the state of that data when you made that query and that you've accounted for everything. It's probably required by law, in fact. Now, if you tell me you're building a monitoring system, you want a very different trade-off. I want to know when we violated an SLO as quickly as possible so we can respond as quickly as possible. And I don't need to be exact about it. If we only query 90% of the data and like we're a little bit off in when we calculate that SLO violation, who cares? It's probably right. And if we're wrong, like it'll be okay. But I want to know sooner. I don't want to know in five minutes. I want to know now, right? So we can respond faster, so we can fix problems. Um, and finally, security. So I think a lot of people, especially security people, like to think of security as a trade-off between insecure and secure. And that is not what it is. It is security versus usability. To illustrate this, if you want something to be secure, lock it in a safe and light it on fire. But it will not be very useful. This will not produce a business that makes money. Sorry, it just won't. You need to make some trade-off. It doesn't mean I don't care about security. I do. But we also need to get something done. We have some problem to solve. And the trade-off that you make here depends on your appetite for these two things. If you're writing software, for the NSA, you care a lot about security for very good reasons, and you're willing to trade off your user experience to get it, and your users are probably fine with that. We should still care, but it's very different if you tell me you're writing software to be used by a bunch of like retail workers that make minimum wage. Their appetite for that is very different. Um, and finally, we need to talk about time. <clears throat> we're not actually going to have a philosophical discussion about time and the true nature of time. We're being practical here. But we still need to talk about time because even in a practical sense in distributed systems, time is just hard. Um, and a big reason it's hard is because we have these intuitive beliefs about how time is supposed to work. Time is supposed to be linear and it's supposed to be monotonically increasing, like seconds since the epoch. Like, it's just what your brain wants to believe and it's just wrong doesn't work out that way. We have leap seconds. We have daylight savings time. We just decide to change the clock because whatever, because the law says we have to and it sucks. Um, we have snapshots where we take a snapshot of a machine and then we like come back a week later and it comes screaming out of the void and finds the whole world has moved on and like it doesn't, what, what, what do we do now? Um, 
we have choices. We have a trade-off to make of how to fix this problem, right? A typical sort of NTP way to deal with this problem is skewing the clock. We'll just like nudge these seconds and make them a little longer, a little shorter, or whatever, and like nudge that clock back where it should be. And if the clock's off by a little bit and like maybe, probably, um, it'll probably be okay. That's probably fine. But what if you're launching that thing and like, you're launching the system and its clock is way off, right? And, you know, Cloud init or Docker Compose or Systemd or whatever has this big long list of all these things it's trying to start up because you want to start running that compute and printing money as fast as you can because you're wasting time. Um, and then you like, need to issue certificates or something. All of these things are going to fail unless you have a consistent view of the clock. It's fundamental to security to a ton of stuff. So you better get that clock right, right fucking now because all this shit's going to fail. Like, these trade-offs matter, right? And, like, I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's in the normal case. We talked about good, fast, and cheap, and you have to pick cheap. Well, every once in a while, you do get to pick not cheap. An example of this happened at Google, unsurprisingly. They said, we want a database, or at least a global data store, with monotonically increasing timestamps. They wanted time to work the way that we think it should. And they made it happen, and this is how Spanner works. Um, now, I never worked at Google. I'm not going to try to represent how Spanner works. I know there's people who worked at Google here. Um, but at a very high level, they made heavy use of hardware-based clocks, GPS clocks, and atomic clocks installed all over the place in order to make time work the way that we think it should and have global consistency and monotonically increasing timestamps. So yes, sometimes you can make the other choice, but it's going to cost you. And that come brings us to the end of philosophy. Let's try to apply this like they did. So, algorithms and patterns. <clears throat> okay. So once again, when we talk about algorithms here, uh, I'm not qualified to teach you math. I'm not gonna try to teach you math. We are taking a Wikipedia level view of this stuff. And there's a reason for that. Right? I don't know what your problems are. I don't know what matters to you. I want you to see some patterns, and then if you have that problem and you need to dive deeper, you will know enough to go learn more from something more reputable, whatever. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. That's okay. Uh, you can also ask ChatGPT. It's actually kind of good at explaining some of this stuff. So, new world. Okay. We're going to start with big O notation. And this is just a little bit of a rant. Um, big O notation comes up a lot, especially with interviews. It's just a notation for describing algorithmic complexity. Algorithmic complexity is important. I don't give a crap about big O notation. How often does it happen that you have five different algorithmic implementations for the same problem and somebody wants you to rank order them before you pick the one that works? Like, that is a test question. That is not what happens in the real world outside of like maybe a couple times at Google. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't care about this, but like, you need to identify the piece of your system that's slow and figure out how to make it faster. And if on studying big O notation helps you do that, great. And if you never learn it, also great. Like, I suck at this to this day. Hasn't hurt me. Um, but let's talk about some things you actually will see. Traveling salesman problems. So any kind of thing that involves routing. If you're routing packets, if you're routing trucks, if you're routing airplanes, um, Imagine all of these dots are you know, cities, right? And you're trying to pick the shortest distance to visit all of these cities exactly once and come back where you started. Like a million different types of routing fall into a kind of problem that is roughly mathematically like this. Because remember, when mathematicians and academics study problems, they're looking for generic solutions, generic algorithms to solve every possible flavor of this problem, right? But you're not. You're solving a specific problem. Um, but there's a whole bunch of problems that are roughly like this. Um, another one is knapsack problems. In the knapsack problem, right, you've got a backpack and you can put a certain amount of weight in it and you've got a bunch of books that are all different values and you wanna maximize the value you put in there and stay under the weight limit. Okay, let's make that a little more real world. Imagine you have a bunch of knapsacks that are different sizes and a bunch of different books to put in them and do that same thing. Well, now that's a bin packing problem. So if you have a bunch of different containers and you need to run them on different size worker nodes, like that's what this is. It's that kind of problem. Um, and there's a ton of different real world problems that are flavors of this. 
So generically, this is where you'll hear about P versus NP, NP hard and NP complete type problems. Um, you can go read the Wikipedia or do something else. Like you can read about the real math of what that means. I'm not going to try to explain it, but those are the keywords that'll get you to the start of it if you really care. This is an extremely well studied area of computer science, as some of you I'm sure well know, and most of this stuff is unsolved, right? In the general case, if you can solve those, you can win the Millennium Prize and like good on you. But I bet you that's not what you're doing at your job. <coughs> So my advice to you, if you need to solve a problem like this, is three things. Copy, steal, and cheat. <laughs> so, like I said, all of these problems are very well studied academically, um, and they've learned a lot of stuff. They haven't solved the general case, but for constrained versions, for versions that are not the general case, some of those constrained versions are solved. There are algorithms you can copy that will give you an optimal solution in the right case. For a lot more constrained cases, there's an approximate solution. They will get you within two or three percent of optimal, like, and you can just copy that. Like two or three percent is probably good enough for most of the things you need in this area. The way that you do that is a people problem. It's requirements gathering. This is an interview thing I can tell you for sure because I did it. If you come to Meta and I give you a systems design interview, the first thing I'm gonna do is give you a problem to solve with very little information. And the next thing you are supposed to do is ask me more questions to refine that and figure out effectively what is the least you can build and still give me the thing that I want, right? By gathering more requirements. This is a critical non-algorithmic, non-math skill for you to have. Figure out the problem that actually needs solving, identify more constraints, and make something that someone describes to you as a hard problem into a much easier problem. Because you don't have to solve the problem I ask. You have to solve the easiest problem you can convince me will actually solve my problem. Or they will actually solve my problem. But you can't make it up. It does have to actually solve my problem. I'm gonna find out. <clears throat> but I often don't know my problem very well either. Um, okay. So we mentioned speed versus completeness and good, fast, and cheap. There's one more of these sort of triangular trade-offs that I wanted to touch on, just in case you haven't seen it, which is CAP theorem. Um, and this applies to data stores, typically, or transactional systems. Um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Quickly, in case you haven't seen it, you have to pick two, and you can't, you must pick partition tolerance. Why? So if you have a system with more than one node, they can lose communication. They just can, that's the reality bit. You have to decide what to do in the case that that happens. Your choices are serve errors in order to not serve potentially stale data, so give up availability to preserve consistency, or you can potentially serve stale data and give up, you know, maintain availability and give up consistency. But you have to have a way to deal with that partition tolerance issue. Um, or you can choose not to handle partition tolerance, which means if anything ever goes wrong, the whole thing goes to shit and you lose all three. Like, those are your choices. So pick, you must. Um, so let's talk about a real data store, right? <coughs> Databases and stream processing. We talked about this a little bit. In a traditional database, right, you're bringing together a bunch of data, storing it in a database, and you do queries. And so all of the data is fixed in one place. Yes, there's sharding or whatever, but roughly you have static data and you pass a query over it, right? This is very much in the sense of that uh, imp uh, imperative or uh, you know, command and control model we talked about before, um, which is to say that like ad hoc querying becomes easy. Like yes, the data could be changing, but you have locks or you have you know, views or whatever you have. Like you have a fixed view of the data. You can run this query and be like, oh, I didn't like that. I'm gonna iterate on it and run the query again. And like, it's kind of easy. Um, but it might be slow, it might have a bunch of other problems. But what happens when you need to make different trade-offs and you do stream processing? Well, this took me a little while to think about intuitively um, as I was working on logging systems. This is the complete opposite of that. The query is fixed in place. You have to know that ahead of time because your data is passing through a pipeline and, the and it's passing through the query. So what happens when all the data is passed through the query? Well, you get your response, but if you're doing ad hoc queries and you want to iterate on that, like the data's already gone. Like maybe there's a way you can replay that data back through the pipeline, but it's not quite the same as the first time it went through. So like, how do you know? Like you don't have that fixed view that you could use in that reporting. But it might be a heck of a lot faster. 
like in many cases. So let's think about these trade-offs, right? I talked about imperative versus declarative. Um, speed versus completeness turns out to be really funny because of time. When the query is fixed and the data is moving, what time did you run the query at? And how long does the query take? Like, well, that depends on a lot of things <laughs> that we would need a more clear example to go into, but it's not one single answer that's easy to intuit. Does that matter? I don't know. Depends. Like, who are you showing this query to? <coughs> um, and this is at small scale, right? This is just looking at the data stores. So let's take this and drop it onto some real infrastructure. Um, so this is roughly a logging system that it's pretty generic. It's you know similar to what we do at Meta, what people do a lot of places. Um, so you generate logs on the left there and on a bunch of different nodes. Um, we have a couple different logs coming together and they get aggregated through one or multiple layers of fan in. They go into some temporary data store and then they get fan back out, sharding, bucketing something, maybe multiple layers of that, and then read by different systems, maybe multiple systems. Long-term storage could be a database that we query, um, stream processing that we run queries on, stuff like that. <coughs> um, okay, so let's put some actual data in here simplest possible log that I could describe as an example. Like, we're gonna write the numbers one through 10 as individual log messages in here and then try to get that back out to the other side. It should be very obvious what we want to come back out to the, uh, back out the other side, just what we wrote. Um, and that can fail in a bunch of different ways for different reasons, so let's talk about it. Um, first, data duplication, right? We get more than one, two in that first example. How does that happen? Well, it could be a bunch of reasons, but Maybe that thing got written from one hop to the next, but the acknowledgement failed. And so we sent it again in order to maintain reliability so as not to lose data. Um, and we ended up with two of them. Like different things with buffering, because there's probably buffering at all these different layers too in various different ways. Could be buffering in memory, buffering on disk, like lots of things. Um, so we could get duplication. Um, we could get things out of order. That's really easy to happen. Oh, we've glossed over one thing here. We're assuming that we wrote all this stuff in order from the beginning. But if this is log A, it's being written from two different nodes. Do those two nodes actually have global consistency for the time that they're writing stuff? They might write them out of order from our perspective. Like, but let's assume that they don't. Like, let's assume it went in the way that we want it to. We might still get things out of order. Like, let's say something buffers along the way and different things buffer on different machines as they're getting aggregated and the buffers fill up and then get flushed at different rates um, and we end up with things out of order. There's, again, a million ways this can happen. Okay, um, and finally, maybe we lose some stuff, right? The nine is missing. When we know what we put in, it's really obvious that the nine is missing, but if you don't know what logs you expect, how do you know what's missing? Like, how do you even know anything is missing? How would you tell? And does it matter? Or how much does it matter? <coughs> um, so wait, where's our trade-offs there? So. And then time. Like I said, time makes this way harder. So we're missing data here in our stream processing query, but as we talked about, we have this time range when our data passed through. Well, did we really lose that nine? Maybe we did. Maybe it was buffered to disk somewhere and then that machine exploded and it's just gone forever. Like, it could be that. Maybe it buffered to disk and it lost network connectivity and got delayed. And it got delayed until it gets fixed by an, an hour or a day or a month or like how long is your repair cycle? I don't know. Um, so does that mean it was lost? I don't know. It depends on your requirements, right? But if that data shows up an hour later and that streaming query has already completed, it thinks that data is gone, but maybe it's not. And I don't know if that matters or not, but you better. Right. So the way this tends to play out and the, the trade-off that's more unique to a logging system is at least once versus at most once. A bunch of these different tuning trade-offs that you can make at these different layers with buffering reliability come down to what's worse, duplication or missing data. Now, it is possible that you could have a situation where data duplication is really, really bad. Um, I think that's less common, um, but let's say that, you know, it's data where you can detect the loss because you're matching it up to some other data source and you can be like, well, we know when stuff is missing and we can replay it. So we can say like, oh, okay, something's missing, we'll, we'll, we'll try again, we'll send it again. Um, if that's true for you, maybe you want at most once, like prevent duplication probably in a lot of cases you want at least once. You would rather have duplication because losing data is bad. So then what do you do about that? 
Like you know you're gonna have duplication, you've made the choice to do that. Well, what you're probably gonna do is do some post-processing. You're effectively gonna pay the cost of additional compute in order to do deduplication after the fact to get rid of your duplication and give you something that approximates exactly once, right? Like you make your trade off, you pay the cost, and then you get the semantics you want. But what about, well, okay. Let's say one more thing about scale. We talked a little bit about buffers. So these messages are really, really short. Um, so what about latency? Like when you have really, really short messages, the data is small compared to the overhead of sending the message. So if you want very low latency, you send the messages individually so that they go out faster and you can get extremely low end-to-end -end latency even with a bunch of hops in a well-designed system. Um, you know, I don't know, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, like something like that. Um, but if this is a logging system at Meta, you need extremely high aggregate throughput. You need to move a bunch of data. Most messages aren't that small, but some are. Um, and so you do chunking, right? You have a buffer and you also use those buffers not just for reliability. You say, well, we're only gonna send the message forward every 500 milliseconds or every second. And then we can chunk together a bunch of those tiny messages like in one bundle and then we can send things faster with lower overhead. This has a massive effect on overall throughput. Um, but at the cost of, on, on our system, you know, end-to-end -end latency is more like one second or two seconds instead of you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds. Like for us, that trade-off is okay because we need massive throughput and we'll take a little latency to get it. Um, but yeah, exactly once. What happens when you really do want that thing like what they wanted with Spanner? Well, for a super high volume logging system, probably not what you want. Um, but in some cases you do. So what do we do about it? So for that, we go back to our Wikipedia diagrams. <coughs> I need to tell you about the two generals problem. So imagine these things A and B are armies. A1 and A2 are pieces of our A army, and then B is the opposing army, and A wants to attack B. Um, <clears throat> but the people commanding those two bits of the A army need to coordinate. They need to attack at the same time or they will fail. So they need to pass messages to each other. But they can only do that by passing messages through enemy territory. Um, and so those messengers might be killed, um, manipulated, affected in some way, our, our messaging is unreliable, right? There's a whole bunch of math that goes into this and what you find out is you can send more messages and acknowledge them and send acknowledgements back and forth and more and more and more and no matter what you do, there's always the chance that the last acknowledgement doesn't make it back and there's some small risk that your attack will not be coordinated. This is an unsolved problem, potentially an unsolvable problem of coordination. Like, you cannot be perfectly sure. <clears throat> and this is where we get into consensus and, um, you know, consensus algorithms, distributed locking, and leader election are typically the places where you need this, which applies to a bunch of different stuff. Uh, we saw this with Spanner. Spanner does this. And if you have this type of problem, like we said, you provably cannot be completely sure. However, you can provably know the risk. Um, so there are algorithms, there are methods you can take that effectively give you a set of trade-offs to say for different amounts of resources you're willing to spend, messengers you're willing to put at risk, you can have a known... <laughs> wow. A known level of confidence in how and whether or not you will be coordinated, right? Or you will run into a problem. Um, so there are reasonable approximations, things for you to copy. Um, the first of these is called Paxos. Paxos is a family of algorithms. If you haven't heard of this, this is what Spanner uses. A lot of other things use this. Um, like They do a very good job. They are mathematically proven not to solve the general case, but for the approximations and for giving you a set of trade-offs that are reasonable. Um, you should not reinvent this, you should use it. However, there's also, and has become popular in, in the last several years, an algorithm called Raft that does almost the same thing. It does it in a slightly different way, but it has almost all the same mathematical proofs. Algorithmically, it solves the same problem in eh, roughly the same way. Um, so why? Why does this exist? Well, because of this trade-off we talked about before. The algorithm was not the problem. It was a people problem. Paxos is really freaking hard to understand. It just is, and people were tired of that. And they were like, well, we want something that's easier to reason about. And so one of the design goals for Raft 
was to solve the same problem in a way that was easier for humans to understand. This is what etcd, if anybody used Kubernetes, um, is, is based on Raft. Um, lots of other things are too. <coughs> so remember, you get to pick both of these problems to work on and sometimes it matters. I'm not espousing reinventing the wheel, uh, but in this case, they had a good reason and arguably actually hit it, so good for that. So now what? Okay, what should we learn from this? Entropy is not optional, right? You can build your system ignoring the fact that it has to run in the real world and it will tend towards chaos. Or you can design your system to inherently attempt to deal with reality, mitigate entropy, and potentially you can hold back some of the chaos most of the time. Sometimes you'll still get woken up in the middle of the night, but hey, we need jobs, right? Um, but remember, you're solving a practical problem, not a theoretical problem. If you wanna go work at a university and do that, great. But you don't have to solve the problem you're given, but you do have to solve the actual problem that someone has and not what you wish the problem was or the thing that lets you work on the cool tool that you wanna work on. Um, but you get to ask questions like how good is good enough? How fast is fast enough? You get to gather more requirements and constraints and turn what someone presents as an intractable problem, which maybe you now know how to recognize, um, into something that's more constrained and more tractable. And then you get to cheat. You don't have to tell them that's how you did it. <laughs> but you get to cheat. Um, and hopefully you understand why this is my breadth first approach to learning this. This is not what they will teach you in engineering school. Um, but the two things I will suggest to you if you're taking this approach like I did is um, seek out interesting problems. I would never have gone into depth in any of these problems until I had something tangible and some real problem that I cared about solving to apply it to. It was the only way I was able to get interested in studying and, and going into that depth. So find interesting problems and then we'll see where they lead you. Um, and also find interesting smart people that know about the stuff to surround yourself with if you can. I've been really fortunate to be able to do that. When you have imposter syndrome, it's hard. It makes you wanna pull away from those people that you think are smarter than you, but they have a lot to teach you, so you need them around. Um, and don't try to remember details. This is why we did that Wikipedia level version of this. You don't need to know the details if you don't have to solve that problem right now. You just need to remember the pattern so that you know how to go deeper into it if you actually need to solve that problem so you can find what to copy and what to steal from. <coughs> Um, and I did go to theater school, so I'm going to finish on a theater topic. Um, I want to tell you about the word hamartia. This is a term that comes from studying Greek theater. If you've ever felt like the protagonist in a Greek tragedy, hopefully that doesn't happen too often in your work, but maybe sometimes. Um, but hamartia describes a fatal mistake, a fatal flaw that leads to the downfall of our protagonist. And the classic fatal flaw is hubris. It's ego, pride. This is also a classic fatal flaw for engineers, sometimes fatal in the literal sense. Um, maybe not so much for computing, but sometimes. Um, this is real, right? There's a temptation. We're too clever for our own good. We fall in love with our tools. We fall in love with a certain problem and decide we need to apply that solution to everything. Um, we don't revisit our assumptions, or worse than that, and, and I see this all the time, we constantly talk about iteration. We talk about learning and building minimum viable products. And then what happens over and over is someone builds a minimum viable product. They build version zero of something. Um, and then what they should do is build version one and version two and learn and revisit their assumptions. And then they don't. They throw it all away and they build another version zero of the same thing and say, I'm gonna get it right this time. This time I'm gonna be smart, I'm gonna know it all. That is hubris, that is a fatal flaw. That will lead you to your downfall. Don't be that guy. Uh, that is all I have for you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, want to have questions? <laughs> Let's see how we're doing on time. We have a few minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, perfect. If we have questions, I will run mics to you. Please don't ask without a mic so we get it in the recording. Hi, so you mentioned about the compromise between security, you, you mentioned about the compromise between security and usability. Uh, did you have any situation in Meta or any other jobs in which sec proposed security uh, methods, let's say, or techniques didn't went well in, in production? 
Of course I would get that question first. Um, yes, I'm sure I have a lot of examples of this. I don't have one in mind, and so I don't want to just riff on it on something like security. Um, I don't want you to take that to think that I don't care about either security or usability, because I do. Um, what I will say is often this one, again, comes down to a people problem. It comes down to different people with very different agendas and very different things, different problems they're trying to solve. Um, and especially for production engineers, at least at Meta, a big part of what we're doing is taking the bigger picture of figuring out what to do about like security engineers that are only thinking about security and not thinking about some of the non-security related consequences of their choices. Um, and somebody else who cares about the service and probably isn't an expert in the security. Um, and I'm an expert in neither, and somehow I need to try to get what's best for both of those people. Um, there's a lot of room for that. It's a hard skill to have. Come be a PE, we're awesome. Um, you said that, oh, what was it, the Paxos and Raft algorithms have a trade-off. What is that trade-off? <laughs> Um, I think what I said is Paxos and Raft implement a trade-off, right? Yeah, the the, the trade-off is that you can't have absolute global consistency, at least like the way the two generals problem describes it. Like there's always a risk of something happening, but we can quantify that risk. We can say we can make a trade-off between how many resources we want to expend. If we need to reduce that risk more, we can pay more costs, right? In the analogy, we put more messengers at risk we reduce the risk by a known amount, um, but that's a high price to pay. And for some applications, maybe that's not worth it, right? Maybe we don't need that level of assurance, but we need to quantify that or else we don't know. What else? Okay, I'm, I'm kind of riffing here, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, but kind of pushing back on what you were saying before about getting the security people to care about usability and the other people to care about whatever. I feel like whenever you're having a conversation in a big group of people, everybody ha comes with a particular perspective. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's a matter of getting, kind of unlocking them to think about, like, a particular view. And then sometimes it's about getting them to understand something that they don't actually know quite yet. Uh, do you have any tips uh, or, like, strategies or tactics, whatever, in dealing with a large group of people in itself kind of a distributed system and trying to get them to kind of some sort of middle ground in a way that's like approachable and I don't know, good, I guess. Does that make sense? It does. I think that that is its own whole talk. Yes. Um, in the context of this talk, um, I think that illustrates the, pro the, the point of people problems and how important people problems are because there's nothing math related about that but it's critical to get that right to actually solving the practical problem you're trying to solve for a business or an organization or whatever it is. Um, I have an idea for a talk that's focused on security where I would have to address that head on, and so if I get a chance to do it, then hopefully I will have something better to say about that. Cool, see you next year then. <laughs> yeah. But also I'm not a security engineer, so I don't know if I can give that talk with any authority, but maybe. I'll make a call back to something you said in an earlier slide, which is requirements gathering is really useful in those conversations. Anyone else going once? Going twice. And sold. Thank you all. Oh, do we have a question? I do. One more question. Okay, last so, one. So I wanted to ask about when you were talking about speed versus completeness. So what is like an example where you, like something like that happens? Like, you know, when do you pick speed and when do you pick, uh, like, what happens to the completeness? Like, you know, do you verify less or something to, uh, to Yeah, sure so the, the, the example I gave about a monitoring system is very much like this, and, and we have this, right? Um, so we have a very fast query engine for, that we use for monitoring, not just monitoring, but ad hoc queries for debugging a lot of things. Um, and not to get into the implementation, but effectively a lot of those queries, you will often get back results based on only 80, 90, 95% of the data that should be queried for completeness. Um, and it'll tell you this, and it, it has an idea of how complete it was, but like some of those things weren't fast enough or were failing or whatever, and so we just ignored that and then gave the results from what came back. Um, which means, you know, your answer could be off by 10%. 
And for a monitoring system, what I care is that I can query it in seconds, right? Whether it's for a monitor or for debugging, right? It keeps that fast at the cost of completeness so that I can quickly do ad hoc debugging and figure out what's happening during an incident and move quickly. And that completeness is rarely gonna stop you. It quantifies it so you can see, and if you're like, no, I really need it, then there's things you can do and go to other data stores to get completeness. Um, but you typically don't need it. But we don't use that for financial reporting or for something where the completeness mattered and we had time to wait. Thank you so much, Casey.